Preface The Radical Importance of Decision Making The historical evolution of government has involved an increasing consolidation of decision making power in the hands of bureaucrats, technocrats, and public officials. Simultaneously, progressive or radical elements have struggled for greater access to power, often as part of a greater movement for decentralization and democracy. Power structures have responded to those pressures by adapting more democratic forms on the one hand and on the other by removing ever more decision-making power from the public sphere. In modern democracies, voting rights are considered universal, though in actuality they exclude people younger than 18, non-citizen immigrants, a percentage of ethnic, racial, and political minorities intimidated away from the voting booths, and in some countries, convicted lawbreakers. However, individuals and communities enjoy less and less autonomy as schools and other institutions are subjected to increasing government oversight, laws governing ever more minutia proliferate, and economy is centralized and globalized, media are consolidated, and commercialism invades and appropriates public spaces. Many people have heard the truism about means determining ends, about being the change we wish to see in the world. Leaving aside the implicit oversimplification regarding tactics of resistance, this truism actually is important in regard to decision-making methods. Throughout history, human groups have demonstrated an almost infinite variety of social organization and political strategies. An anti-hierarchical society and the attendant decision-making strategies are certainly within our reach if we look past the economic structures, military and police forces, and popular culture that currently stand in the way of the necessary changes. In addition to overcoming the organized barriers of economic and state violence, we need to relearn how to be social animals and become practiced and comfortable with new models of decision-making. In building our resistance, we need to resist our own authoritarian habits. In empowering ourselves, we need to become familiar with social power that is based on equality, not exploitation. We need to learn consensus. The Benefits of Leadership Part of our education as subjects of an authoritarian society is indoctrination and all the supposed benefits of hierarchy and leadership. It is an article of faith. Yes, dictatorships, including those kinds that allow general participation through majoritarian voting, are expedient in one sense, but this expedience masks a more profound inefficiency. Hierarchy developed to allow group activities to be controlled and exploited by a central leadership, not because hierarchy increases the possibility of realizing human potential. Quite the contrary, authoritarian systems suffocate the individual. Because hierarchies must limit the number of people who rise to positions of leadership, more people must be followers than leaders, and they are thus prevented from developing their potential for thinking and acting autonomously, or establishing voluntary relationships with peers their activities and their relationships are dictated by their position in the hierarchy. Everyone must work for the singular initiative of the person or people at the top of the pyramid. In contrast, in a horizontal society, everyone is free to pursue their own initiatives and, through cooperation, accomplish more. Non-hierarchical organizing and decision-making is also more efficient than traditional hierarchy because it frees up a great deal of energy and resources that would otherwise go to enforcing the party line and keeping people passive and obedient. In fact, authoritarian decision-making only appears to be more expedient because in our society it is the type people have the most practice with. With time, radical organizations can learn to organize and make decisions at least as quickly and efficiently as they might using authoritarian methods. Perhaps the most important disadvantage of an authoritarian organizing and decision-making 
is that it preserves the oppressive power dynamics that exist in society at large. In a racist, sexist, capitalist society, white people, males, and those with a college education hold power that they do not deserve over people of color, women, queers, and trans people, and those without a diploma. This generalization even holds true in many radical groups. It is not at all unusual to see progressive and radical organizations with a leadership, official or unofficial, consisting entirely, or mostly, of white, college-educated males. Even in hierarchical groups with a diverse leadership, oppressive dynamics are likely to persist. A hierarchy preserves an elite culture, so women or people of color who climb the ladder often do so by adopting that elite culture and disowning their solidarity with those they left behind at the bottom of the hierarchy. We see this all the time when conservatives appoint a token woman or person of color to a powerful government post. Efforts by group members to challenge these oppressive dynamics are seriously hampered when power is concentrated in the hands of the privileged authority. Not only are oppressive dynamics harder to change, they are encouraged. The existence of a hierarchy isolates group members from one another, so feelings of hostility are more likely to develop than feelings of solidarity. This tendency is compounded by the fact that the goal of authoritarian decision-making is not to come up with the best solution for everyone, but to win. Majoritarian voting is especially good at fostering competition and creating minorities within a group. This method makes sense in a world where people have to exploit one another to survive. It does not make sense in a world based on mutual aid, freedom, and cooperation, and it does not make sense if we are trying to build solidarity to create that world. Hierarchy and authoritarian decision-making were developed so that elites could control the collective power of a society. We must develop anti-authoritarian decision-making methods that keep power in the hands of all, to free society from that legacy. Representation Authoritarian states that call themselves quote-unquote democratic after the slave-driven Greek polities have given us the idea of representation as a means of achieving equality. The masses have power to elect and recall representatives, and the representatives have the power to work in an efficiently small group to manage the details of everyone's lives. Such a system purports to overcome the authoritarianism of leadership without descending into the presumed chaos of leaderless social organization. Efficiency is the ultimate justification, and in truth it would be inefficient to bring everyone from a massive nation or multi-regional organization together in a huge meeting to make decisions. But that proposition itself demands scrutiny. Under what circumstances do human groups become too large for horizontal consensus decision-making to be practical? The nation, in the Western sense, is not any naturally arising unit. It is a manufactured identity designed to achieve political unity within the territory conquered and controlled by a central leadership. Absent the attempt to subordinate large numbers of people to a hierarchy, human polities will be only as large as they can be to accommodate horizontal, leaderless decision-making. Hierarchy did not evolve to answer questions of efficiency. Hierarchy developed to impose control and to use that control to expand the group, to specialize and alienate daily activities, and to centralize power until society could not run without hierarchy. Leaders were not needed originally, but once in power, they imposed the economic, social, and political changes that made them necessary. In the present mass societies, activists may often have a need to communicate and coordinate across distances or among huge groups of people. This need and our socialization may influence us to adopt the same representational forms of organization as those employed in the institutions we are fighting. 
The idea is that activists need as large an organization as possible to direct a unified effort to organize the masses. But groups of individuals are turned into masses in order to be controlled. Activists, not wishing to be the vanguard of some new authoritarianism, need to break themselves and their communities out of the disempowered, alienated mass. Communities can work together in a spirit of solidarity and mutual aid without centralizing decision-making power. Activists in Virginia can communicate with activists in California to share information so that each group can make the best decision on how to effectively overcome a common enemy, but there is no need for different groups to come to the same decision. What works for one may not work for another. Organizations or federations that, for whatever reason, join groups from multiple communities should be structured in a way that makes it impossible to forget that power flows from the level of the community and the individual. The Spokes Council model used at a number of major protests by the anti-globalization movement is an effective alternative to a permanent body of formal representatives who have assumed full decision-making authority for their constituency. A large number of affinity groups with a common aim each send spokespersons to meet and discuss the action that all are planning to participate in. They may just share the potential plans, targets, or capabilities of their affinity groups so that the spokespersons can go back and communicate the broad picture to their groups, and then each group can have better information to help formulate their specific plans. The spokes council can also take a more active role. Spokespersons can communicate their desires, limitations, and general goals expressed by their affinity groups, and using that information as a starting point, the Spokes Council can create a structure or framework that assists each affinity group in pursuing its desired ends, and allows each affinity group to work together without ever relinquishing the ability to decide its own course. Examples of how a Spokes Council can create a useful structure rather than dictating the contributions of each member group include providing tactical information, maps, surveillance, etc., and resources, bicycle locks, PVC pipe, legal and medical aid, etc. For affinity groups to set up road blockades during a protest or by setting up days of action and sharing useful information for a campaign to simultaneously target multiple locations of a particular corporation or other institution. Just as political hierarchies exist to control a society, an activist organization may use hierarchy to try and control a movement. Leadership is not about efficiency. It is about control. People can struggle without being told how to do so. History shows that when governments face an enemy without a leader, whether mutinous workers or an, an indigenous society, they appoint one and then negotiate, co-opt, assimilate, and control. A leaderless opposition is the hardest to defeat. Individual Autonomous Action In the absence of formal leadership, there is an array of horizontal decision-making strategies. These are forms of decision-making other than group consensus that would have a place in a free society and can also play an important role in consensus-based organizations. At a very basic level, the individual should not be subordinated to the group to the extent that individual autonomous action is discouraged. Such action, performed by lone individuals or small groups of individuals, is vital in a number of circumstances. When security concerns prohibit discussion of an action in a larger group, when people need to act out of the poss possibly stagnating confines of a group and act without broader approval, in order to stir things up or spark initiative, or when the project at hand is of a creative or personal nature that could not broke a potential homogenizing or stifling group process. However, the potential of individual action is limited because it fails to foster social growth in dominant and submissive people, and other people who need to learn to work as part of a group, and it fails to build the strong relationships 
that are the backbone of a serious revolutionary movement. Ultimately, individual actions must exist with consideration of group decisions, just as individuals exist within the context of larger human groups. Spontaneous Consensus Once a group decides to use consensus, there are countless varieties from which to choose. The kind most people are familiar with is spontaneous or informal consensus. It's the kind of decision-making you use with good friends and in other healthy relationships. No articulated process is needed and no leadership because of a strong foundation of trust and intimacy. This is what consensus looks like when we've had a lifetime of practice. Needless to say, it is an unrealistic goal to use spontaneous consensus for political organizing, unless your organization consists of a small group of close friends. A look beyond the often insular confines of Euro-American activist circles reveals numerous indigenous societies that are non-authoritarian and use consensus decision-making. Indigenous and Afro-Colombians in the Chaco area, for example, use consensus for the decisions of entire communities and for decisions in regional councils that include as many as 50 communities. Each, each society's model was slash is a little different and best suited to people of a particular cultural background. Many of these societies first had authoritarian decision-making models imposed upon them during the colonization process. In any case, the historical abundance of cooperative, consensual groups gives lie to the claim that c competition and authoritarian leadership are simply parts of human nature. However, indigenous models of consensus exist within a specific cultural and historical context. The consensus model described in this book is the model I have learned among the North American queer activists, anarchists, anti-racists, and anti-capitalists with whom I organize. Most of these activists have grown up white and middle class. The model they use is most practical and helpful for people from a similar background. It is important to recognize that culture is inherent in every human act. The form of consensus described in this book is a cultural artifact. It is not the single correct way to make decisions, and it is a process that should be open to change, especially when your organization consists of people from varied backgrounds. These pages describe a very detailed, organized process. I include exhaustive discussion of process because process is an effective crutch or bridge for people not used to anti-authoritarian decision-making. With practice, the process can be set aside, like any tool that is no longer useful. Consensus Process Adopting a conscious consensus process is significant in a number of ways. Commitment to the ideal of Consensus signifies a bold rejection of society's dominant values of order, hierarchy, competition, and formalized leadership. In this way, embracing consensus rejects the generally unspoken Western assumption that dictatorship is efficient, that people need leaders to recognize and pursue their own interests, that life, evolution, and progress must be fueled by a brutal competition between individuals rather than by the mutual aid and voluntary cooperation of human groups. The idea of consensus also pushes anti-authoritarian resistance to develop and demand an even more fundamental understanding of freedom. The notion that freedom is a legal concept that can be guaranteed on paper is rejected. This new freedom only comes when no aspect of our lives can be dictated to us. In other words, it means that our involvement is crucial to the decisions that will affect our lives. Adopting an explicit process to facilitate consensus decision-making signifies a new understanding of human potential. It acknowledges that we are not the slaves of human nature or any other tragic flaw, but that we can learn an almost unlimited range of behaviors. An explicit consensus process serves as a crutch or bridge 
which intentionally reinforces the learning of consensus until a new cooperative anti-authoritarian society provides that reinforcement as a matter of course. The process also recognizes that the oppressive systems of our society deeply affect our own behaviors, and that people who are typically silenced by our society can also be marginalized within ostensibly anti-authoritarian groups unless there is an intentional structure that helps expose and overcome these power dynamics.